practicing the piano. That is the most important lesson for playing piano. In that fact, much more important than the lesson itself. Because it's a way to teach yourself between the lessons. What I encourage when I bring students to practice intelligently is not repetitively. While the repetition is necessary, especially for the muscular memory, cognitive reactions that you have to build for sensations of depth of keys and distance shifting, the repetitivity should be done with complete and focused attention. Even if you do a little bit, do it fully. And it's important to never play mechanically, robotically, autopilotly. <laughs> the difficulty is that practicing is lonesome and um, there is nothing to measure against. Like in a quartet when you practice, you are measuring with the bows of the others and the intonations and you're matching, you're building something together. Whenever, when you practice alone, um, you organize your thoughts, you hear the music in your ears, you practice the sections, you replay, you repeat, you trip, you restart and you get angry <coughs> and you get frustrated because it seems like a Sisyphus um, rising on the mountain and just dropping before reaching it. Same as uh, another analogy about the um, uh, sand castle on the beach. And so that's when the discouragement comes in. And what I suggest for practicing intelligently is to um, take literally few bars, one hand, and play them through without hearing the other hand play, but imagine it or perhaps sing it, or if not, speak it. La la la, do re mi, sing it, whichever way you can. But don't play it materializing it with the hand, because that's the, uh, the touch of the fingers that memorizes more than the melodic or uh, whatever texture line that it is. And you want to play the other hand, let's say the left hand plays an accompaniment alone. And um, you're not used to hear it alone when you play together because it's part of uh, what brings the melodic, let's say, line to bring its melodic expression. But if you are able to hear individually secondary parts, mean inner voices, accompaniments, and then you focus on them separately from the other part, then take the other hand and play the melody or the thematic material, if it is a light motif, let's say in the right hand, and listen to it very carefully by saying it, singing it, solfeging it, whichever way you can, until it becomes part of your inner world, independently of your fingertips and independently of the left hand's material, so that you can literally focus on each hand at a time. Sometimes they share parts between thumbs um, that are the middle voices. That is more tricky to work on. You could uh, write it down for a few bars, it doesn't have to be the whole piece, and then um, play one part and speak the other part and then watch what you wrote. Not the score that's written where they are bunched up and down with um, stems up and down on the same stem, on the same um, staff. But with your writing on, on several voices. And so disconnect your uh, visual memory from the score, create your own text for the few bars that are, let's say, giving you trouble. Just writing them down is very soothing, in a way. 
and very meditational because you go detail by detail you don't have to overlap them superimpose them try to fit them we don't talk even fingering yet just thinking the movement of the notes of the phrases of the lines of the layers whatever it is if it's a fugue or a sonata or a song or accompaniment obviously it will be different texture but it doesn't matter disconnect the music from the fingertips um, connection and think about organizing your ways of um, following by speaking or singing the different elements. Once you've put this apart, you start putting it together by playing it from memory. And you're not sure that you'd play exactly every note together correctly or the flow of events. It comes at a moment where it stops and you don't remember what's next. Well, then that's what I think is best is take the moment and write down at least but not more than four bars of what you think might be um, what you were playing without to look at the score of the original piece. It's all about appropriating the texture um, with all your musical sensorial elements, of course essentially the ear <laughs> without which is difficult to play music if not to comprehend or respond to it or filter it and receive it. But listen to it intensely, listen to it by elements, by layers, by hand, not all together bunched through the fingertips, which is ultimately what you have to do no matter what, because a piano is placed through the fingertips. But in order to get to that visible part of the iceberg, you want to work in depth on knowing the texture other than only through your fingers. As if you speak it, chew it, uh, taste it like you taste an ingredient when you cook. And you taste this dissonance and this consonance and this um, arpeggio or this um, delayed um, resolution suspension. It's all obvious because it's written out on the score and you just play it. But in fact, when you write it and then you sing it or speak it, then you finally put it together and you play it. You feel like you wrote it. You might think that this suggestion is <coughs> unrealistic if you play a sonata that's 30 minutes long, obviously. But you know what? The brain adapts amazingly to um, challenges. And that's what I meant. Do it little, little, little groups of bars at a time. And it doesn't have to be for the full piece. Specifically, a section that is difficult for you. Ah. And something which is interesting about it is that when you reach the point of, that's interesting, major third and minor sixth, or minor third, major sixth, well, it's oscillating. Must be the tests of um, alarms. I hope. <laughs> Test only. But what I wanted to finish saying about the practicing, which I think is very important, is then once you memorize the most difficult section of what you play, whichever it is, what do you do? Then you go through it over and over and over and over again until you play it mechanically. You play it without thinking about it. You play it as if um, it didn't matter. But that's exactly what you don't want to do. You want to um, be intensely focused even if you practice let's say, few bars. And don't worry, don't get impatient. Don't get impatient, nor discouraged, because it feels like spoon-feeding an ocean with a little teaspoon, no. It feels like you're entering into a way where your brain is able to retain the details that matter and the whole piece that you play. So when you play your piece, and you play a section, and then you connect it to another section, um, you start hearing more of what you do than only of what you feel through the fingertips. 
I believe very much in this immersion in the structure of the piece, in the texture. Um, because ultimately we all practice to clean up details. And I think overall what matters is the completion of the piece. So detail by detail you get to the full vision of the piece only when you practice it with separate elements than only the fingertips. I'm very convinced that this practicing can bring very beautiful results. When you get closer to the keyboard and you touch each of the instrument's keys, you start realizing that if you really observe, you push always the key that you have to play, but you have to focus on the piece of the finger or the section of the finger that lifts after you played. And you have to practice the after note as well as the next note depressing. The post depressing of the note, when does it lift? How do you organize it so it doesn't have to be overlapping nor dry? Um, if you want a legato, a non legato, a legato, a staccato, a wet staccato, a <laughs> there's so many layers of delay of lifting the finger when the next depresses. And this is the practicing of the hold and poke. You hold the one, you poke the other three times, you hold the next, etc. And then once you do that, you organize yourself in rhythm patterns. And then um, you feel like as if the fingers, the hand carries the patterns inside the palm support and you just drop it as if the fingers drop from the palm support while the wrist is the bow and phrases. I'm deeply convinced that this can be a great help because at this point you only organize when you depress the fingers for the next note but this case you also organize when the fingers lift after they have played. Especially 3-4 and 4-5 because of their common tendon you have to practice on their independence. It's wonderful to take one element at a time, build it together as a group of um, fantastic mechanics organization that you develop in the independence of the fingers. And then you phrase, then you sing, and then you could even um, rest to observe what you have done and then start again. Don't just repeat right away because that's when you don't learn. You feel like you do by repetitive um, uh, situations, but in fact you don't. What you need is to do a certain time of repetition and then you stop, you observe, you hear what you just did, it echoes in your head, you watch the score intensely, this is your element of connection with the piece, and then you go back to the section. And then you go back to the section, just like somebody who carves or sculpts or shapes or whatever you do manually, craftsmanship. Yeah, that's the word. And of course you would think, oh, what's it to do with artistry and musicianship and expression and emotion and intensity and drive and meaning? Well, it, it has to do with it. It leaves your um, mind free to do that. Because you focus so much on the details so that at some point you can play them and think about where they lead you. So you become your conductor and your fingers are your orchestra. And you always think ahead. And if ever at some point your concentration intensity is lesser, then stop. Because at that point, you've already risked to have an accident. Because if you are watching your fingers play, you're behind your fingers playing. You have to be ahead of your fingers playing. You have to be your conductor and your fingers your orchestra. It is truly important to teach how to practice. It is easy to peel the mistakes out of the um, lesson performance of the students um, 
presentation, but it's too late. It's better to anticipate so that these misread, misguessed, mispracticed, misunderstood, misheard, misfingered uh, things don't happen. So you can finger ahead the different ways they can handle with their own uh, personal um, craftsmanship of their hand. How they can uh, ergonomically connect to the piece so that it becomes in the difficulty of performing the complexity of the texture a pleasure to shape it. The industry of playing it, the labor of making it should be the um, if not pleasurable at the sense of let it go and just um, sensorially express yourself you have to be in a sense shaping the keyboard like a sculptor and this is what I think is so important from the staccato to the legato to um, connect the energy through the knuckles energy going through when you play legato the notes to feel it like a bow to feel the phrasing, to feel how the resonances of the sounds that you produce through an action that you don't touch directly the sound production of, but that's why it's an action in between you and the sound, that you can influence the way you want the sound to come out by the way you hear it inside yourself, orchestral imagination, voice, choir, colors, paintings, sculptures, films, dialogues of uh, theater plays, so many things of nature, the trees, the sun, the shadow, the light, the spring, the fall, the seasons, the... It's not just the notes, the notes seem to be the vector for your inner world's imagination through which you filter what you bring out playing the notes of another composer than yourself. And in case you are yourself the composer, that doesn't make you the best performer. So there is a before and an after. Before is the composer didn't write it and after it exists and others have brought their fruits from these beautiful pieces to their own um, fruition through their playing. And I find it so meaningful when the practicing becomes the key factor to playing it um, closest to what you imagine, idealize and wish. And does not have to be just because it could be the idea of trying to imitate some pianist who you heard play the piece and that could be an aim but it's a short-term aim. The long-term aim is what does this piece mean to me and how can I carve each detail practicing dotted um, rhythms, practicing hold and poke, counting loud voice, playing separate hands, playing legato, staccato, non legato, um, um, immersing myself in the details of the craftsmanship while organizing in my thoughts the shapes of the phrases and the statements and the um, agogic, uh, the plethora of events that happen through the piece that are part of the um, syntax of the storytelling through the notes. And then the pedal and the acoustics and the resonance, which you can add compared to other instruments. Um, but then, on the other hand, the harmonization overlaps the melodization and the melodies need their intervals to be one note leading to the next, leaping to the next, uh, rising or dropping, not connected and holding both tones, because then you are it's difficult to 
to accept that, but we only have a right foot pedal on the piano for all elements. Even if, um, if we had two keyboards and two sets of pedals, perhaps we could do a differentiation between how we hold the harmonization accompaniment and separate the melodization. I don't know. It's probably better this way because even when you use the middle pedal for pieces composed by composers who didn't have the middle pedal. So what do you do? You know, uh, it's a full circle. You try it, you think, wow, it's neat. I can get to organize the fragmentation of the elements without them becoming blurred. And when they're blurred, perhaps to a certain extent in that soup of notes that the composer imagined and didn't shy from trying to display on the keyboard uh, notation without a middle pedal, let's say, organizing the holding separately. <sighs> it reaches a point where you think they needed, they wished, they imagined a certain level of combination of the resonances, where the melody, the harmony, the pulse becomes some kind of a one element altogether. So yes, you do have floating dissonances depending on the touch quality of the um, dynamic range, of the range of the keyboard itself, so that you can find ways to bring it to fruition. And that's a good thing about it, is that the piece reveals itself almost differently to you through the circumstances in which you play it on a different instrument in a different acoustic. And you have to take that in account instead of fighting it. Oh, I hate it, it's too resonant. Oh, I don't like it, it's too dry. Oh, the keyboard is too heavy. Okay, fine, that's true. You have to play with the elements. You're not responsible for the architecture of the place, nor for the person who built the action of the piano. And yes, some are heavier than others in feels in the action. Others is because mostly the keys don't lift as fast but regardless you have to constantly adapt to what you yearn towards and that's when the practicing of the Holden Poe gives you so much um, control over the unexpected so that with an unknown piano in an unexpected acoustic you can still reach something closer to what you wanted than further than what you wished. And it might be also a question of um, um, letting the shoulders down be free for the muscular weight, naturally dropping, and supported by the palm, you feel like you can reach to the depth of the key, no matter which dynamic range you play soft or loud, tempo fast or slow, always deep and fast from close-up. And this way you feel like um, you're more in control. Of course you cannot do that if you have fast sh shiftings, but even so you can always delay a tiny bit in order to touch before you play after you moved around to grab a bass note or pick a high note because of course there is the rhythmic element to keep to keep the tempo f from rubatoing or slowing down um, but it's better to sometimes um, accept that you need to just take the time even if it's a nanosecond and then you shape better the quality of the note that you touch a bass note not just grabbed or reached um, but anticipated and prepared with the elbow around so that you can be in front of the key and not grab it sideways. It, it changes a lot. It's as if you have another hand on the lower register while you play in the middle register. Two left hands in the accompaniments of Chopin. It's very comfortable to imagine but it's not practical. But you have to divide in order to organize the textures, expression and of course all these elements are part of a whole 
um, flow of the events of musical expression. And I believe very much in the fact that even in performance you have to count inside your head to be your conductor of your orchestra and not the follower of your fingers. To a certain extent, the pianist's brain is to process so many elements more than an intonation, a resonance and a vibrato which is essential for voice or single voice instruments. You have to, of course, you don't control the vibrato of the instrument. You don't control the intonation of the instrument since it's already tuned. Therefore, all what you have to do is control the touch quality that resonates after you impacted the sound and <clears throat> adjust the tempo and the phrasing so that the decay of the sound doesn't interfere with the phrasing's arched shape or at least bring the phrase to where you wish so that it doesn't drop on the way by the um, resonance um, decay because even if you ignore it since musically you hear it arching but the instrument inevitably decays every sound especially longer values you have to be aware of it and not in denial of it and organize ahead of it because it's at the moment of the touch that you organize its delayed um, decay until the connection to the next note. And of course not all of them do that at the same time, especially in a fugue. Mm. So you have to constantly anticipate the organization of delayed releases, delayed tensions, creating dissonances that vanish into consonances. And this is also part of the practicing so that you organize your hearing from the inner out for the, what you want to express and from the outer in from what you hear of what you expressed. And sometimes this is the most difficult is to monitor in real time what you project yourself forward while you're preparing. Each note, each phrase, each articulation, each touch, each um, crescendo, uh, each gradual, basically step by step build up of a um, crescendo is as meaningful to not too early play loud nor to play too early soft when you have a gradual diminuendo. It's not on the spot that it matters the effect even if you use your nacorda to play softer or quicker, even if, um, no, you should always plan where everything you play leads you to, in the term of a beat, bar, or hypermeter of group of bars. And then you reach the point where you develop it as a storytelling, as if they were words. You cannot interrupt the breathing in the middle of a between two syllables of a, of, a, of a word when you sing. Same thing with the piano. You cannot separate them or re-enact them if you drop too early dynamically the range of the decay and you feel like you have to restrike it. Of course you can restrike it, but if it's not written in the score then, well, it's a saving situation, but you have to plan ahead. In real time playing, thinking ahead and organizing details while planning the arrival point of each group of um, bar sentence. It's a thinking at several levels at the same time that you have to do while monitoring what you produce. If it were easy to say, as I do, it would be easy to do when you play. But um, it's, an, it's a multitasking aim to focus, organize, and um, at the same time be free to react in real time to the unexpected. A finger won't on the wrong key, memory slip because you don't remember all of a sudden what is the next thing that happened, could be concentration problem or distraction. Regardless, you have to be able to react in real time. Where do I go back to? Where am I in the piece? 
in terms of tonality or formal organization, do I go back here or there? You want to minimize the um, on-stage performance um, disappointment that the note spoke too loud or a note didn't speak at all and it just chagrins you so much because you practiced it so much to not happen especially in sections that usually nothing bad ever happens in the practicing but the heightened quality of hearing the emotional intensity what people consider of course stage fright of the situation and the exposition of yourself um, of your practiced um, craftsmanship um, coming out not fully perfect in its details um, of course ruffles you makes you feel like all this for that and so that is also a very important moment to practice towards when you think about playing is how am I going to deal with the unexpected when it happens because it will and the matter is how will I deal with it in order to be the smoothest restoration of the flow of the events in terms of where I go and how I go back to and then how do I pass through to avoid panic as much as possible avoid <coughs> rear view mirror watching because it's always easy to wonder why did it happen to me while you're still playing ahead so it's not the moment during a performance to analyze the reasons or to get angry at yourself even if you are because ultimately it's not productive it's easy to say difficult to do I grant you because it feels um, very um, frustrating as I would say but at the same time the music appeals to you from the next phrase the next sentence the next movement and you feel like you're on a track and you're on a storytelling and so okay you slipped on a word but you continue you think ahead and I think if you keep being inspired by the beauty of the art which you serve by craftsmanship and artistic mirroring of the piece that you receive in order to transmit it to the audience for what it means to you at least the way you perceive it then I think this is the most important in the live performance is to keep that connection with the piece and the audience always ahead it's always time afterwards to analyze organize rethink uh, write down on the score what happened and think that perhaps this will never happen in this section next time I have a chance to play it even if other places might happen but regardless you learn from this experience that you know where you are in the piece and how you move into the next section and this is very important because if you stay only on the section that you fixed you don't know how the section goes through the passage work from one bridge to the next so it's not not by note is phrase by phrase, is sentence by sentence, is um, section by section, and then ultimately movement by movement. Oh, I know all these things are so easy to enumerate, to um, define theoretically, but willpower, discipline, and relentless daily effort to accept, to entirely question yourself from scratch to top every day you play the piece every day you carve and you shape and you try to embellish at its best the presentation of the piece according to the inner truth which comes to you from it that you need to transmit at least to become the vibrant um, membrane that um, brings it unadulterated from the score to life to the audience and the fact is that unlike painters or sculptors there is no material element that remains after your work creative recreative inspired repetitive because it's always a canvas that vanishes ephemerally as soon as you've played 
no matter how you think you did well or how thing you think you reached a certain point of what you wanted to do every time you start from scratch and therefore you put yourself in danger not only psychologically but also emotionally and um, really um, mentally for all these hours and hours that you give to reach the point where you can connect the dots of the different elements in a such natural flowing way that they appear to be as natural as simple in the sense not of simplicity but of obviousness of uh, earnestness in the expression of the emotional expression that the music talks to you in the first place with and then you transmit it that way it is a very touching situation where an artist who lives on the canvas the painting then are the gazes of the different people over it that define it, redefine it, value it, reevaluate it. But the painting itself is the same objectively. And I find that in a living music performance, the beauty of this art form is somewhere emotional because ephemeral like a smile a kiss a perfume a gaze a memory of a shared instant that stays immaterially inside your soul heart whatever you want to call it because it's not only meaningful it's moving it's something that you shared and here you might share it with a dead composer and a living audience and you feel like in an escapism inevitably trying to be somewhere where you're not while being where you are and hoping that what you're going to do will correspond to the expectations that you've placed in yourself to reach the level of what you love in the piece either by other players either by itself as a piece not necessarily only reflected by the way others play it or played it and it's a very um difficult element to um, acknowledge that no matter how well you've played it next time you start from scratch there's some basis some ideas some fingerings some phrasings some rehearsed repeated patterns in practicing Okay, that gives you a sense of bearings that you know more or less how it's going to go. But you have to be as focused as relaxed. Intellectually, mentally focused and physically relaxed. Because it's only then that you manage to have the right shifting distances, the right um, level of depth of each key and speed in the depth of the key to perform, to, to reach the connection of the tones. The beginning of the note comes from the silence. And then it goes to the next silence. It seems like as if the music is a real speech. so more universal because without lyrics but the piano notes often express these lyrics as if they're imaginary songs without words notes without meanings So what can it be? Is it um, a daydream, an emotion, impalpable, un unable to be named? Hmm. No matter how much experience the teacher has, 
not much. As if the experience is some kind of a, um, energy that is necessary to go through the peace. I think my wisest advice would be don't count on it. Be aware, be reactive, be unexpectedly surprised or marveled by how the piece reveals itself to you every time you play it, regardless the consequences of this or that mistake or this or that uh, non-control of a ex example, um, how can I say, it's not just a wrong note, it's perhaps just a misbreathing or miscounting or um, of course it can be a finger slip but um, of course today more than ever the competition is fierce, clean playing is not an achievement, it's a given base of expectation for professional performances. But what is then after and beyond? What is the added value, the personal spark, the idea that when you play it, it's the single time every time, the meaningful time of restating it, just like an actor does when they say, um, um, let's say, theatric situation with a um, monologue. And they think to themselves, then they speak to the audience. It's sort of like um, reflecting to yourself. It's a bouncing back mirroring between the audience and you around the piece. It's almost chamber music. You and the piece and the audience. And so all the practicing techniques for which I was speaking earlier, they need to be integrated in the musical statement which you make when you play. It's too late to think about technical practicing during the performance. All you have to do is just focus on all what you have practiced and go through it meaning go through the piece from A to Z and let it happen while you anticipate every technical aspect of it, but not musical. Somehow, somewhere, the composer with the pedaling, with the acoustics, the piece reveals itself with some kind of <coughs> freshness, like a student who makes you rediscover it, like when you play it and all of a sudden after practicing it, it's a new piece on stage that talks to you, the piano talks to you, you exchange, it's chamber music, really, as if it's a partner, the score, the music itself, the thought process of the composer, and you're blessed and responsible to give it a new coherence because it's you, because it's then or because it's now, the, the now, regardless of the after and the before, it's, the, it's a fierce fact that in the present time, while you play, people who know the piece, of course, <laughs> there will be those who will say it's not supposed to be like that. Oh, I don't like the tempo these or this this pianist chose. Um, I like it better with someone, some, or perhaps by themselves. Fine. But even those who know the piece, the storytelling of yours can overtake them to think that that's an aspect of the uh, expression of it. I didn't think about it. And no matter how much older you are, you haven't been through all the aspects of the piece through your lifetime. And that's humbling. Because if not, it would be just a sense of um, pontificating and repeating yourself as if you want to convince yourself that you are right. I think you should not try to be 
pedantic or teacherish or pedagogical in the performance. Performance is without hierarchy of experience. For certain things, technically, yes, a little more, especially for stage fright, for some, they get less when they performed it more. So yes, in that aspect, there is something, but the practicing of the elements, as I said earlier, separate and put in different ways together, sang, written, performed, um, phrased, shaped, um, perhaps even written, um, in order to appropriate a difficult section so that you play it with your own text reading it. And when you play through, you don't memorize the score of the publisher, you memorize your writing, um, so to say, with your visual memory. I think at this level the piece becomes, well, you enter in immersion and the piece becomes you, or you become the piece during the ephemeral moment of the performance. Naturally, restarting many times helps to define exactly what you want on this piano and this acoustic, and that is a recording. But you know what? Nothing replaces the flow of how things are stated, the spaces between the words, the spaces in the length of some vowels compared to some others. It's, there is something beautiful about super practicing to organize in order to allow a certain, um, how should I say it, spontaneity. That's the word that is usually considered something to absolutely not do when you're a professional pianist practiced and prepared. But spontaneity shouldn't put you in trouble on stage or trick you, so to say, by getting you away from the organized systematic way to control what you produce from your keyboard playing. It should be a um, welcome inspiration. You sit among an audience and you're a listener plus, the one who plays, and you feel like a chameleon blending in the nature. And um, some people feel like a sore thumb in the middle of a stage because it's not natural to be so exposed. But once you are there to serve the piece, the statement, the, the, the soul of the piece, not even specifically the composer or, or the idea that you have of the piece as a scope and genre and style and importance, just a musical statement that is shared with people. Of course, if you place yourself mentally in that positive state of mind, all your practicing will be so productive because it will adjust and adapt to the unexpected of the stage. And that is ultimately what practicing is, lonely, repetitive, sometimes dis disappointing, to frustrating, feeling that there is no way you can assess any progress towards something that you want to, in a way, impossibly solidify and if you really solidify it then there is no more room for that spark of emotion of an expression so it shouldn't be solid or musical it should be solid and musical it shouldn't be prepared and delivered it should be prepared and adjusted to the unexpected of the delivery it's not about being um, fatalistic and saying, no matter what, I'll make mistakes. It is to accept and not to fight this, but to just think ahead enough to control most of the elements that you can control while you express a line. Because if you control without to express a line, it's like saying words that make no sense or no meaning. You have to put... Um, arched phrasing in the statement you have to build it it's not you the piece already is but what you do is just bring it to life 
through your psyche, your, your emotion, your filter of understanding or, or feeling it or being able to play a certain tempo and oh, why can't I play faster or why can't I play louder or I don't have enough sound or my hands this, my hands that. I hear many students um, face this kind of limitations that they feel they need to go through and above. And I find that you shouldn't fight anything, just let the music speak. The instruments project enough, the modern ones, especially in the acoustics of today, which are very generous and they already contribute to prolong the resonance of the sound and give some lush to the sound. It sounds like, like sun rays and it, uh, compared to the practice room or the upright or the electronic piano that you can use when you practice. So inevitably you enter in an interaction with the own resonance that you produce while you play. Of course you don't hear it on stage because your ears cannot be in the hall while your body is on the stage, but you hear the feedback of what the stage brings you, which is not exactly what the audience hears in an acoustical resonance hall. But nevertheless, it is an exchange. You project something and then you receive their attention, their silence, their kept breath so that they don't miss a pianissimo or a triple pianissimo, a mezzo triple pianissimo. Hmm. It's very important to create a situation in which you allow, while controlling, the unexpected to bring out your spark in the piece. No matter how much you've planned it, it's going to reveal itself differently. So you don't feel powerless and just following it like a leash of a dog that is running and you have to... No, you are in charge of your own by counting inside yourself, by always having a plan where each phrase lands, as I said earlier, it's very important to have short-term plans for each section, not just the general overview, but while the focused concentration, also the allowing it to, to, to breathe. It has to breathe, it cannot be stifled in a strict corset of repetitive um, organization, because at some point, and better sooner than later in the performance, the mistake will happen. And instead of fearing it and getting disappointed and losing concentration over it during the performance, and in fact, a little detail which in the um, spontaneous statement is unnoticed compared to a recording, that I agree. But in a concert performance, the least you think about what happened, the better, because you have to always focus on the aim of the sentence point of view. Where does it lead me? Where does it go? And I could have tripped, but I continue on my, on my phrase, on my line. I'm gliding like, like a bird and the, soaring in the blue sky. I feel like I am on a, I let the music pull me up. Of course, my disappointment of the way I played can crush me down, but that's what practicing helps to avoid. To a lesser or some bigger ex extent, but still it does. It takes courage, abnegation, self-control, endless preparation, and then trusting letting go and organize, concentrate, but don't squeeze. Let the phrase exponentially expand its, let it, let it blossom. Let the peace blossom under your hands.